As you've probably seen the force of friction and how to deal with that in the previous course, in this course, we're going to focus on some of the more subtle details regarding friction and specifically targeting and combating some of the possible misconception that might have come up. And the first point I want to cover is through this question. In fact, in this question, there's no specific mention of friction here. All you see is this person is being held on by tension because it's attached to a rope. There's a force at the vertical surface pushes on her legs. This, in fact, is a contact force. And a contact force is, in fact, made up of two components, which is your normal force as well as your friction force, in this case, holding her up. So that's the first point, is that we have many times treated friction force and normal force as two separate forces, but they're really just components of the one contact force. Of course, mathematically, we can always decompose the contact force into two components, and that's going to be perfectly fine. But just a little reminder that both of those are components of a contact force. And then you might be tempted to go and say, oh, well, we have force of friction, so we can use FF equals mu FN, and then we can find the friction force, and everything's great, right? Uh, no, because here we're dealing with a stationary person, so not moving. So we're talking about mu S here, or static friction. And static friction doesn't give you an equation. What static friction gives you is an inequality. We cannot use this to give us a specific number relation between these two things. This is not an equal sign. So we have to solve for the friction separately before coming back to maybe find out what this uh, coefficient of friction, or minimum coefficient of friction is in part b. What they do tell us, however, is they do tell us this angle of 15 degrees. So basically, the contact force, we already know the angle. It's a force with a known direction, but with an unknown magnitude. In that sense, it's very much like tension, as we've seen before. So let's deal with it like that. First things first, we will draw a free body diagram of the person, treating her as a spherical object yet again. Uh, she's on Earth, so she's going to get mg downwards. And then we're told that she has a tension, which is running along the ropes. If that's 31 degrees here, this is going to be 31 degrees as well. And that will help us decompose our tension. And then we also have the F legs which is at 15 degrees with the horizontal. Defining my x and y and breaking everything down, we can solve and find out what both the tension magnitude and the F leg magnitude is. Just to save some writing, instead of doing vector sign and absolute value sign at a time, we're just going to use that to signify magnitude. We'll just simply drop the um, vector sign just to save some writing and not have it look so, so clunky. So now that we have a free body diagram, we can sum up the forces. And of course, not moving means my acceleration is zero. So when I sum up the forces, ma, I expect to get a zero. Well, what am I adding up? You can see all the forces here as we break them down. So f lake gets broken down into cosine 15i plus sine 15 in the j, both positive as we have defined it. And then you have t, again, dropping just the vector sign to signify magnitude. And this one, because the angle's written with respect to the vertical, we're going to get sine 31 degrees in the i, but negative, plus cosine 31 degrees for the y component. Then, of course, we have my mg, which is negative mg in the j hat. So Again, we have two unknowns, but we have two equations because we have one in the i and one in the j. Making a little more room, we can see that in the i component, we can work out the two horizontal components add up to zero. So we can then solve for one in terms of the other. I choose to solve for t. 
doesn't really matter. They will both work equally well. Cosine 15 over sine of 31 degrees. Looks a bit messy, but remember, cosine and sine, they're just decimal numbers, so we can punch in the calculator and get a particular number coefficient to relate these two things. Then we look at the j, which is our second equation, also equals zero. But now we can sub in this thing for t, and then we can collect like term and isolate, etc. So we're going to dump mg on the other side, and then we'll factor out the f leg. So we're left with sine 15 degrees plus all the rest of it. And then we take this chunk and we divide over and we'll be able to get the magnitude of my leg force where M of course is the mass of the entire person, 52 kilograms. G is our usual 9.81 meters per second square. Using the calculator, we can find my F leg. Once we have our F leg, we multiply that by 1.8754 to find that my tension is 512.58 newtons. So typing it up pretty, 273 and 513 newtons. So on to part B, this is the actual friction bit. We're asked for what is the minimum coefficient of friction between her shoes and the cliff? The one we talk about the minimum, this is where our inequality comes in. This is an inequality, so we can't solve for a specific number, but we can get a minimum number. When we swing Fn over, we'll see that the mu s have to be greater than or equal to a certain number. And this certain number can be found as such because we know that, here's my F legs, that because we have a vertical wall, my normal force is perfectly horizontal and my friction force is perfectly vertical. So it makes a right angle triangle with the 15 degrees, you know, basically decomposing that contact force into the friction component and the normal component. So then we basically have sine 15 degrees over the same force, cos 15 degrees, the two forces cancel out. So we could have done this even before we finished the first part. Sine divided by cosine tangent. If you remember the identity, if you don't just punch in the calculator, it's all good. If you punch in the calculator, you'll find this number is equal to that rounding out to be 0 0.268. So that's the minimum coefficient of friction, which should be plenty sufficient because most likely rubber on anything is in the rough neighborhood of 0.8 or above. Just to summarize, two fine points about friction we talked about is first of all how friction and normal force are components of the overall contact force. They're not necessarily separate forces, although we do break them down into components. And to relate them, if we're in a situation where we're not moving, we're stuck with this expression with the static coefficient of friction and an inequality. It's not an equation, you can't find actual numbers, so we'll have to do something else to solve for my friction force separately. In this case, we're given this angle so we can decompose easily, or otherwise have to enforce that there's no acceleration and solve for this unknown friction force and then come back to see if it meets this inequality criteria or not. And we'll have more examples of that later.